Good morning once again. This month we've been looking at the book of Acts and we've been also looking at this sense of God calling us to to certain things. Sometimes when we get calls, we're not that excited. We'll look at the phone number. I was listening to one minister actually confess, sometimes I see your number and I don't answer. And I thought, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty bold. But we know that sometimes calling can feel like a burden. It can feel heavy. And so this month, as we think about the ways in which God calls us as the body of Christ, that is not always an easy thing to do. And sometimes it comes as a burden. This final series is called The Call to Open Doors. The Call to Open Doors. By the way, one of the things I love about summer here at United is that when I drive up in the morning, I see the doors open to our church. And what a beautiful thing it is to drive by and see that the church doors are open. Something about that really touches me. So in case you haven't noticed, we have security cameras on our building. Through a series of town hall meetings last summer, it was recommended by the community that we purchase security cameras, that we put them up, so that we might better be able to determine the problematic activity on our lawn. These security cameras have now been up for almost a year. I imagine they do something because one day, a couple months ago, the police came by and said, hey, does your footage cover the streets? I said, no, but I learned out later it did. And so we gave over footage to the police. And then a couple weeks later, the FBI came by and said, hey, we'd like to secure some of your footage. And so I'm realizing, wow, our footage is being able to serve uh, officers. Rarely, I've added an app to my phone so that I'm also able to look at the footage, but rarely do I look at it. But every now and then, I'll take a look. And I must confess to you all that I feel a little bit scared. I feel like I'm peeking in on people without them knowing it. Also, I'm a little bit scared about what I might see, especially on the night hours. So this past Friday, for some reason, I looked at the camera and there was this Asian dad with his daughter. I'm gonna assume it was the Girl Scouts. They started out on Blackstone trying to get into our church. (laughs) They rang the bell, no response. Nope, not successful on Blackstone. I was surprised because then they came around to Blackstone and 53rd and came up these stairs. They tried to open the door. You can guess what happened. Again, no success. And then they surprised me again. They came over to the handicap rail and they tried to enter there. No success. You would think these two would give up. Nope. They went all the way to the door in the annex. Ding, 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 entrance. Here's the thing, getting into our church, getting into churches, I have discovered if it's not on Sunday and sometimes Sunday, there are a lot of doors, but most of them are locked. Now, given the recent violence across America in grocery stores, in schools, in churches, some of you might think locked doors is not a bad idea. The way that we do business has changed. But this notion of locked doors versus open doors, I'd like to linger here for a moment with you. Gordon Drack, the author of One Foot Planted in the Center and One Dangling Off the Edge, years ago when he was pastoring a dying church, felt despondent one day at the enormity of the task of church renewal. 25 members in a big church building. He found himself, he says, one day after church just crying. He sat there and he had a pity party. Well, he eventually picked himself up. There's a bakery across the street. He went across the street and he says he bought the sweetest, most sugary baked item in the bakery. With powder falling on his chin, he stood across the street looking at his church. He's not sure if it was the spirit or all the sugar, but he had a vision of open doors, lots of them, doors welcoming people in, lots of doors. 
where there were bricks and locks and no entrance. He says he saw entry points. The word of the Lord for him was the church was not open enough. The word of the Lord for him is we desperately need more doors welcoming people in. Just hold on to that. Today in the biblical text, we find ourselves amongst the disciples opening doors for a lady whose gifts were being used for monetary benefit. We can relate to that. She has a gift for seeing beyond the surface of things and would speak out with invitation. This angers her owners, whose monetary source has now dried up. They are angry at Paul for freeing this girl. And the owners make such a fuss, painting a different narrative until the men are beaten se severely. And what happens to them? You remember, they're thrown in jail. Her owners made good money off of this woman, being able to tell people things about themselves that they did not know. And now that Paul has stripped her of this ability, they were not going to get paid. They were mad at Paul. Who does he think he is upsetting our current situation? And so they wouldn't let it go. You know how someone keeps riding and they just won't let it go? They are holding on to their anger. They brought more and more attention to the situation until Paul and Silas end up getting the crap beat out of them. Clothes removed, they continue to hit them with items. And after all of that, they throw them in prison, reminding us that no good deed goes unpunished. It sounds to me like they might have been in pain with no medical attention, no one to care. They're taken to the innermost part of the jail and their feet are bound. Maybe now is a good time for them to be just a little bit mad. I mean, we were just doing a good thing. Maybe the time is now for them to feel just a little bit mad at the establishment. Maybe this is a good time to say, why does it seem like the rich keep getting richer? Why does it seem like those that do evil advance? Maybe this is a good time to question systems of oppression that continue to do well at the expense of poor people. Maybe it's a good time in jail to think about the violence humans are suffering at the hands of mental health, hatred, and guns. Maybe it's a good time to scream at the top of our lungs, Lord, what is going on? Is anybody mad today? Is anybody tired today? Is anybody upset over the news today? Is anybody appalled today? I mean, Jesus, baby, Jesus, adult, Jesus, soon to come again, Jesus, we need you. We need relief. We need hope. We need justice. We need mercy. We need so much grace. But the text tells us that these two sang hymns. They're beaten. They're thrown in jail, newly sent out, were treated like criminals, and they found themselves in jail, and they are singing. At the Fifth Ward meeting this week, Alderman Hairston informed the community that a casino is coming to Chicago. Casinos are good for the economy. Las Vegas, Nevada, is a prime example. Gambling is responsible for over 60% of the jobs in Las Vegas. Nevada is the fastest growing economy in the U.S. And 90% of their money comes from, guess who? Visitors. But here are the cons to casinos. Listen, casino establishments will always get more money. They will always make profit they will always make more money than the players that come and frequent them. You can lose your money. And somebody ought to just say amen. Come on now. 75% of those they say gamble responsibly, but 20% overindulge. 4% need an intervention, intervention and 1% 
fall into destructive behavior. Just as Jesus was concerned about the one in the 100, can we not be concerned about the 1% or the 4% or the 20%? And more than likely, the income for this new casino will not come from outside. It will come from us. It seems like profiting off of humans is an old issue, whether it's the woman over here in Acts or us today. This is an old issue then, now, all these years in between. Our own country was built and thrived off of human slave labor. But the workings of God often upset plans for profit. Paul was concerned about something deeply spiritual, freeing folks from their own prisons and opening doors to new possibilities. The call, the call, the call to open doors. Malcolm X, while in prison, learned that the first prison he had to free himself was not physical, but it was mental, the mind. Malcolm X, while in prison, learned that the first prison for him was not the physical prison, was not the bars, was not the gates. And once he got free up here, there was no prison anywhere that could imprison him. He was free. I think Paul knew this too. It's a spiritual thing. And so he sang, once you're free, there is no prison. How do we live our lives open, especially in this season of open violence? How do we live our lives with our hearts open when so much is scary? downright horrific. I know this colleague of mine that refuses to lock her doors. She refuses to lock the doors on her home. She refuses to lock the doors on her car. Her kids think she's crazy. She grew up with a mom who locked everything up and so she decided that she would live her adult life with no locks. I am always shocked, but one day I pull up on her car, windows down, stuff inside it, no locks. I mean, it's one thing not to lock the door, but to leave the windows down too. And all of my knowing her, whenever you go over a house, you don't have to knock, you can just open the door because the doors are locked, unlocked. And guess what? No one has ever taken anything from her home. She reminds me that it really is a choice to remain open in our hearts and to open as many doors as possible for others to enter into this faith community, to enter into meaningful, deeply soul-satisfying relationships with the Creator, keeping our hearts and our doors open, it's a challenge. So catch this, while they're in jail, they've been beaten up, they're singing hymns, the prison doors open, and so they sit still. To leave would mean the worker would be harmed. He had strict orders to watch these guys. And so Paul and Silas remain. When the worker realized what has happened, a door opens to the guard's heart. Here are two humans who have been treated terribly for doing a good thing. And when the prison cell door opens, they stay, they remain. You ain't got to tell me twice what I would have done. And I know what you all would have done too. When the guard first sees that the gates are open, he begins to panic because he knows he's in trouble. A really bad feeling comes over him. He knows, oh my goodness. And he was about to take his life when Paul says, don't, stop, we're still in here. We're still here. With the prison unlocked, we're still here. You see, they were already free up here. And the guard cries, his heart is open so wide. Yesterday I was walking and these church people came up to me with pamphlets about how to give my life to Jesus Christ. I spoke their language and indicated I'm saved already. And when they tried to give one to Josiah, I told him, no need, he's saved too. <laughs> I was a bit sad because I think maybe they missed the message. Maybe I did too. But at least they were outside trying. Maybe we too will need to eat donuts. Maybe we need to get some donuts, walk across the street and look at our church. Because our answers will not come from here. They will not come from sitting in the pews. I believe our answers are out there. It is only when we meet folks where they are in the world that we too can see just how much 
this call involves us too. Opening as many doors as we can because frankly the churches have too many closed locked doors to live in such a way that our very action open people's hearts to the truth. It won't be what we say all the time because words are cheap. They really are. But it'll be what we do and how we walk and how we live our lives with as much faith as we can muster. It is only in living our lives with as much faith as we can surmount, doors will open all around us. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, there's this saying, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. You are calling us, Lord, just as you called your disciples. And as scared as they were, you still sent them. You are calling us, Lord, and you are sending us. Help us in this world of calamity, in this world where evil seems like it's had the first and the last word. Help us as a community of faith to keep our hearts open, to keep our doors open, to keep our faith open to you, O oh God. Continue to walk with us and surround us and to hold us in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>